<clears throat> Hobart Bramkamp's Art Girls meets the art word halfway in the nether realm of deep film, creature features, science fiction, psycho horror, and science fiction, among other B genre. In a span of, say, 50 years, contemporary art has supplemented abstraction with the B representations or fictions that mass culture won't let go. Uh, but can, uh, no audio, please. By the uh, citation or summoning of fiction, even fantasy, in discursivities given over to abstraction, contemporary art raised an experimental protocol for questions of the artistic relationship to the collective innovations that slumber in mass media culture. That Walt Disney, for example, turned down the abstract proposals submitted by artists for Fantasia isn't only a strong sign of his provincialism. The animation Disney was pursuing visualized close to daydream fantasy, the proximity abstraction occludes or circumvents. Disney had already projected the first fantasy film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which situated wish fulfillment within scenarios of development. At the point of our identification, the princess reclaims the projections of good and evil for a new relationship to her self-loving daydreams. Paradoxically, perhaps, Disney set himself the goal for Fantasia of approximating the high art of abstraction. The bookstore supported bi-genre fantasy, which follows Tolkien's revalorization of the primal time scenarios of fairy tales and heroic epics, resolves the question of wish fulfillment between metaphysical extremes. In its utopian aspect, fantasy carries forward the happy end of redemption, while in its heroic aspect, it wavers between that purpose and the Liebestod of nihilism. This fantasy arc, however, leaves behind the problem of wish fulfillment, which Freud's understanding of daydream fantasy in the Dichtung des Fantasieren also presents as resolved, but with the elisions showing that go into the instant gratification and consolidation of the wish. A trigger in the present summons a memory of an earlier experience, usually belonging to childhood, usually idealized, from which there proceeds a wish which finds its fulfillment not in the present, but in the future now. The result exhibits elements of the recent provoking occasion as well as of the old memory. In the bookstore, fantasy is either right next to the stacks marked science fiction or mixed up with the SF works on the same shelf. It is a context or contest I explored earlier with Philip K. Dick in regard to religious or secular dispositions. In an interview with Arthur Bryan Cover, Dick turned up the contrast between fantasy and science fiction within their respective retention spans. In fantasy, I'm quoting Dick, in fantasy, you never go back to believing there are trolls, unicorns, and so on. But in science fiction, you read it, and it's not true now, but there are things which are not true now which are going to be someday. It's like all science fiction occurs in alternate future universes, so it could ha actually happen someday. According to Tolkien, the happy ending may be escapist in everyday life, but in the end of life, it becomes the great escape, the overcoming of death that Christianity advertises. In this life, we pass in and out of fantasy. When we die, however, we enter fantasy, the other world, for keeps. Dick's science fiction, which forgoes not only the unambivalence of this overcoming, but even the new age channel of recollection of past lives, explores instead memories of alternate present lives. By his promotion of alternate present realities, Dick expanded the finite recording surface of remembrance. But Dick's secular mysticism, 
is displaced by its contrast with the other world of fantasy from the problem of wish fulfillment as basic to its mourning process as the death wish itself. Daydream fantasy lights up the earliest grid of good, bad, evil, and good enough, as explored by Nietzsche, Melanie Klein, and D.W. Winnicott. Fantasy consumes us prior to the advent of the ability, even the need, to mourn. D.W. Winnicott analyzed fantasy in another extremity, that of its dissociation in his patient, whose daydreaming was kept separate from night dreaming and day living. In this patient's history, which Winnicott took down, nothing happened because in the dissociated state so much was happening. I quote, in the fantasying, what happens happens immediately, except that it does not happen at all. Doing nothing carried out the young child's inability to reclaim what she was given as her own creation. And she recognized that the obligation was upon her to fit in, nothing doing. She was the youngest child and by her intelligence played along in the already organized setting of the sibling group bond. That she entered into the group activities on a compliance basis proved unrewarding for all concerned. But her siblings probably didn't realize that she was all the while absent. Winnicott, while she was playing the other people's games, she was all the time engaged in fantasying. She really lived in this fantasying on the basis of a dissociated mental activity. But just when Winnicott and his patient think they can discern that fantasying as such interferes with dreaming or living, the instance of another dream places them, and I quote, on the borderline in any attempt one might make to differentiate between fantasying and dreaming. Was her dream of cutting out a dress upon which she awoke in fact a fantasy that defended against dreaming? But how is she to know? Fantasying possesses her like an evil spirit. The fantasy version Winnicott suggests would be simply about making a dress. The dress has no symbolic value. In a dream, however, the same thing would indeed have had symbolic meaning. Winnicott is able to carry back a key word into the dream. I quote, formlessness, which is what the material is like before it is patterned and cut and shaped and put together. Her childhood environment seemed unable to allow her to be formless, but must, as she felt it, pattern her and cut her out into shapes conceived by other people. This gives the first transferential revalorization of her fixation. While the hope that would make her feel that something would be made out of the formlessness would then come from the confidence that she had in her analyst, who has to counteract all that she carries forward from her childhood, so easily she would have the feeling that she had fitted in and been patterned by the analyst, and this would be followed by maximal protest and a return to the fixity of fantasying. Winnicott's closing sentence, in this kind of work, we know that we are always starting again, and the less we expect, the better. After the restart around formlessness, Winnicott enters the psychoanalytic canon on daydream fantasy to secure an understanding of the distinction in theory, if not in the therapy. I said that fantasying was about a certain subject and it was a dead end. It had no poetic value. The corresponding dream, however, had poetry in it, that is to say, layer upon layer of meaning related to past, present, and future, and to inner and outer, and always fundamentally about herself. It is this poetry of the dream that is missing in her fantasying, and in this way it is impossible for me to give meaningful interpretations about fantasying. According to Freud, wish fulfillment is the plain text of every daydream, what Winnicott refers to as the here and now fixity of any satisfaction that there can be in fantasying. Through analytic decoding of night dreams, however, Freud insists, it is possible to recognize underlying it all the fulfillment of wishes just as plain. 
Thus, Freud aligns analytic dream interpretation with the lowest rung of B culture, while underscoring that this alignment, albeit disguised in the upper regions, delivers the letter of the law of high culture too. I quote in translation, one feature above all cannot fail to strike us about the creations of these story writers. Each of them has a hero who is the center of interest whom the author seems to place under the protection of a special providence. It seems, however, that through this revealing characteristic of invulnerability, we can immediately recognize his majesty, the ego, the hero alike of every daydream and of every story. And yet, Winnicott's connection between dreaming and poetry also holds on Freud's terms and turf. The rapid fire consumerism or fixity of fantasy wishes, which fleshes and flushes out their asocial content at the speed of thought, must be reclaimed in childhood development as responsibility for one's good and evil wishes, and in public discourse, if fantasy is to be presentable to an audience as interruption and deferral of fulfillment. In group psychology and the analysis of the ego, Freud argued that the first poetry was the heroic epic and the first hero, in fact, the poet, who had succeeded heroically in giving fantasy or thought a form and forum, making the offering public. Freud sets this heroism on his myth of the primal father. After the primal father's fall and the ensuing ascendancy of the group or sibling bond, the heroism of fantasy also rises. I quote, it was then that some individual in the exigency of his longing may have been moved to free himself from the group and take over the father's part. He who did this was the first epic poet and the advance was achieved in his imagination. The poet who had taken this step and had in this way set himself free from the group in his imagination, is nevertheless able to find his way back to it in reality. For he goes and relates to the group his hero's deeds which he has invented. At bottom, this hero is no one but himself. Thus he lowers himself to the level of reality and raises his hearers to the level of imagination. His hearers, hearers understand the poet and they can identify themselves with the hero. In what counts as the most extensive reflection on Freud's brief uh, reflections on heroism as a theory of art, the creative unconscious, Hans Sachs dismantles the high cultural edifice via its linchpin, the daydream. The focus on wish fulfillment erotic, appetitive, but also aggressive and death-wishing, renders the simple daydream not only inartistic, but also asocial, even antisocial. The gulf between the tristesse on the center stage of high culture, for instance, and the happy meal of daydream or of its syndication as low-budget entertainment is tested by the exceptional yet typical class of daydreams dedicated to self-pity. In order to produce the pleasure of self-pity, these daydreams are willing and able, my quote sex, to conjure up all sorts of misfortunes, poverty, humiliation, illness, and even death. Other daydreams look as if self-torture were sufficiently attractive to become its own end. To call them masochistic helps only as far as our understanding of masochism extends. Even already in daydreams, then, we find wishes which, Sachs writes, are born under a psychic constellation which bars their direct gratification. The conscious content of suffering, humiliation, and misery makes the fantasy fulfillment of unconscious wishes possible. But the painful input of the unconscious is to some degree evident in every expression or sharing of fantasy that makes a memorable impression. This development can be tracked in an intermediate form of daydreams, so-called mutual daydreams, which take two to communicate the fantasy and thus already step outside the basic law of the daydream, uh, which Sachs um, summarizes as follows. 
Every man wants to keep his daydreams secret, even the perfectly harmless ones, and considers his friends as outsiders when they approach this most sacred precinct of his private life. The fantasy that crosses this barrier is mutual, but only in the sense that the leader and the pack in adolescence qualify as mutual trust. One party first formulates the fantasy while the other party acts it out. Sachs gives the example of two five-year-old boys who become inseparable. Then one boy proposes that they go to India together. It's all they talk about, sometimes walking for several hours through the streets, searching for the way there. The instigator comes up with a new variation. The right way to their goal is to be found at the bottom of the local pond. One must jump in and enter a machine there to be cut up into bits, but pleasurably, not painfully. And when issued whole at the other end of the mechanical procedure, they would be in India. After the other boy's failed attempt in the pond, both went home in the deep end of depression. In the course of his work with the little boy who hit bottom, in the meantime his adult Annalizand, Sachs was able to decode the remembered episode as follows. The flight to India and the attempted suicide represent the unification of two opposing unconscious tendencies, namely the hate, I will leave my mother, kill myself to punish her, and the love, I am afraid of nothing that brings me back to a mother who loves me. While it lasts, the mutual daydream is guilt-free in contrast to every isolated daydream when it is revealed. I quote, the unconscious, as we know, is asocial, but out of the need of reacting to it, of handling it, of giving it a legitimate outlet, we see emerge here the formation of the smallest social unit, which Sachs calls a community of two. Your wishes are my wishes, your guilt is my guilt, as long as this lasts, the two are sworn friends and brothers. Poetry emerges formally and socially then by distancing itself from the daydreamer's exclusive use of fantasy as instant narcissistic gratification for his own person. To win the participation or the readiness to identification of his audience, the poet surrenders his personal narcissism. It is the turn to beauty that initiates a longing for perfectibility never to be satisfied. The sacrificed narcissism of the daydreamer, Sachs concludes, is reborn as the poet's desire for the beauty of his work. While, as Sachs writes, the millennium still may be coming when Mickey Mouse walks arm in arm with the Apollo of Belvedere, in 1942 at least, the prospect of Quoting again, the Venus of Milo running away from a sharp-edged wheel like the mouse in a cartoon is inexpressibly terrible. In the new animated and animistic medium of unrestricted motion, every attempt to have its characters approach beauty has a most unfortunate effect. It is a question of dosage, however, since Zucks views beauty as injected to some degree in any work of high or low culture that must circumvent both the finality of satisfied pleasure and the superego censure of its sustained foreplay. Relying on Freud's understanding of humor, Zucks interprets beauty as the height of reconciliation on a scale of sublimation. The supplemental severity of the superego, which provoking anxiety and guilt trails the sublimation of sex and violence does not enter into the conditions for the creation of the feeling of beauty. I quote, by bribing the superego with the narcissistic satisfaction which the poet offers, um, offers it, he ensures its active participation. This makes every destructive critical attitude of the superego against the ego impossible and prepares the basis on which beauty is built. What is being apportioned off, diluted, and calibrated as stabilizer via beauty would be the death drive itself. Sucks again. The benevolent activity of the superego slightly infuses into the play of ego and id tendencies 
something of the character of the death instinct. Beauty is a quest that attends and attenuates the objective of interested motility while leading in its purity to immobility and quiescence. The presence of death makes itself felt in the sadness of beauty. Although it appears that in mass culture, beauty, according to Zucks, must be kept in quarantine like an infectious disease, because what the consumers are after is not beauty, but interest in action, yet everywhere, Zucks continues, we see people snatching bits of beauty, radio, movies, glamour girls, magazine covers, funnies, thrilling love stories, they all show a trivial, attenuated form of beauty mixed with a great many other things, but some grain of beauty is never missing. Pure beauty, Sucks argues, gives a feeling of expansion, not however toward other people, but toward a miraculous isolation in the proper doses and properly blended, however. Beauty arouses energy. Energy is key in creative unconscious since X argues that technology resolves the crisis that antiquity deferred. The era responsible for the Apollo of Belvedere and the Venus of Milo was able to defer development from primary body-based narcissism to secondary narcissism in which the contest between ego and superego or self-criticism leaves the body suit of self-love behind, but trailing just the same as its negative theology. The psychotic reenacts this history, but on fast forward in the emergency mode. He overstayed the welcome of primary narcissism and entered the crisis of uncanniness, the breaking point of the psychosis. But then delusion foregrounding technological controls can proffer rescue and recovery. We have come full circuit um, then uh, within the mass media publication of our wishes, unfulfilled by the diluted injection and removal of beauty, but converted thus into the energy that sustains thought. Thank you. <laughs>